My life is blessed. No more a mess. Now everything I touch, everything I touch, now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask you to shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. We believe that this message is not a message from Pastor Stan. We believe that it's a message from you. And we know that you're using him to speak this word to us. So we ask for there to be an anointing upon him and an anointing upon us to hear what it is that you would to say in Jesus' name. And we know that our lives are better because of it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Would you put your hands together and welcome everybody that's joining us live? Amen. We welcome you uh, live on Facebook and glad to be with you once again. We're starting a brand new series. So if you could, you know, make a mental note over the next three weeks, we're going to be in this series. Brand new series called Perfecting Love. It is a series, a family series that's based on 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16 through 21. So why don't you open with me in your Bible to the book of 1 John chapter 4, and I want to read several verses of scripture to introduce what God is saying to you and I today. In 1 John, this is the epistle of John to the churches, and he writes in verse 16, saying, and we know, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And we love him because he first loved us. Now, as I said, I'm starting a brand new series. We just recently finished a series that we called The Opposite Faith. It was a series that was actually about fear. Fear is a type of faith. Fear, when you have fear in your heart or when you are afraid of something happening, you are actually drawing that thing to you. It is a true statement. Your fears will come upon you. Job being the example of that, he said, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. That's where people actually got that. But the scripture simply says, he said that the thing, the very thing that I was afraid of happening. Have you ever been there in a situation or circumstance? And that was exactly what you didn't want to happen. And you were afraid of that very thing happening in your life. Well, literally, your fear works the same way that faith works. Just like your faith in God causes good to come into your life, your fear will cause bad to come into your life. So we took four weeks to find out and learn about what fear is. It is a, a type, a kind of faith. It's a firm persuasion. It's you believing that something bad is going to happen. Then we also found out, well, how does fear come into your life? And we looked at that. And then the last thing we looked at was how does fear itself work? It works by saying, it works by doing, it works by impatience, and it works by hate. But in that series, we re really did not deal with how do you get it out of you. We learned about it and how you ended it up, ended up with it. And there's a little bit there that, I mean, if I, if, if I change what I'm saying and change what I'm doing and, you know, act in these ways opposite to, to the, the nature of fear, that that could eradicate it. But this series is about getting fear out of you. Amen. And the way you get fear out of you is by taking time to perfect love in you. And we see these realities in the word of God. 
So I want to read to you an introduction that I wrote that really typifies what we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks. And I would try to kind of, you know, say it off the top of my head, but I really want to read it because I thought it was really good. The purpose and function of family and families is so we can work on perfecting love. I'll talk a little bit more about that statement next week. But the human species is very unique in that we function in families. If you look at the animal kingdom, it's a lot different. I mean, they don't run together like we run together. I mean, the birds probably have no idea who their father or mother is. Those birds you see sitting on a line at the, at the traffic stop or those that you hear chirping in the tree, they probably never know who their real sister and real brother is who came out of that same hatching. <laughs> but for humankind, God established family. And I believe with all my heart that the purpose and function of families is so that we can perfect love. That work begins with God's love for us and our love for him. It extends and continues with our love for our spouse, our kids, and others in our lives. With fear being such a damning factor and a part of life, God's solution to the problem of fear is perfecting love. He gives us opportunities in families to eradicate fear while perfecting love. And obviously that statement should make a world of difference and make a lot of sense by the time we finish this. Amen? Amen. So let's begin today in the first part of this in 1 John 4 and 18. There is no fear, zero fear in love. But perfect love, somebody say perfect love. Now, when you use the word perfect, it could mean flawless. But in this case, it doesn't mean flawless in the sense of perfection. I literally looked it up. It means full grown. When the Bible and the Greek word here, it, it, when it's talking about love, it's talking about love being fully grown or fully matured. Another description of this, this Greek word was complete. And it also referenced like an adult love. For example, there's no fear in love, but in an adult love, a, a fully grown, a fully mature, not a child love, and certainly not a teenager's love. <laughs> Have you ever had a teenager tell, I hate you? <laughs> I've had a teenager tell me that. Amen. Well, a complete, fully mature a perfect love casts out fear. So if there's fear on the inside of you, if you could cause love in you to be fully developed and fully mature, it'll kick fear out. In other words, it will leave you with no reason at all because it casts out fear. So a perfected love gets rid of fear because fear has torment. And love, listen to this, never wants to see you tormented. If you've ever had a child suffer with something as simple as a fever, you, you, you do not want that child to go through anything uncomfortable. Why? Because love never wants to see you tormented, right? This is the nature of love. So fear uh, is cast out by love. But he who fears has not been made perfect or love in them has not been fully developed. Love in them is still like a child's love or a teenager's love. It's not yet an adult love because it's not fully grown or matured. So if there are fears in your heart, then the way to get rid of it is actually to develop or perfect love in you. Now, we do this on four levels. There's four parts of this message. The first level today, we're going to look at being fully matured in love. That is in God's love for us. And then the second part of that 
is our love for God. Go with me if you could to the next slide. I don't know which one it is. Verse 19. You all know this. This is a very interesting scripture. The Bible says we love him because he what? First loved us. So notice his love comes first. Say it out loud. God loves me. And as a result of that, we get the second part of that. I love God. Say it out loud. I love God. I love God. Now, that's the whole message for today. When you develop a revelation of how much God loves you, that matured love, knowing and believing that God loves you, will cast all fear. Think about it. If you're afraid that you're not going to have the money and they're going to shut this thing off or they're going to cancel this or they're going to close that, when you realize that God loves me and he's not going to let bad things happen to me, all of a sudden your fear of something bad happen runs right out of the window. Yeah. Why? Because God loves me. And God, how many of y'all know God can do something about that? Yeah. Amen. That fully mature, allowing that revelation to come. And it's actually one of the greatest prayers that Jesus prayed, as we're about to see, is that we would know just how much God loves us. But then the second part of that is that we have to have a love for God. Amen. So how much does God love you is the question I want to look at for today. How much? How many of you all believe that he loves you? Know that he loves you? But the question is, how much does he love you? If, if, if he were to line you up, me up, and Bishop T.D. Jakes, <laughs> who would he love the most? <laughs> but I, and, and that's a good answer. But I want to look at the answer from this in the word of God. Because I don't know about you, when you go through things and it seems like God loves other people more than he loves you because they're not going through the junk that you're going through. They're not going through the hardship that you're going through. Maybe because all of the mess ups in your life, it's, it, you know, that he ends up loving them a little bit more because they're better than you. They do better than you. They don't have the junk that you have. And that kind of affects our perspective because of what we're going through. Amen? In 1 John 4, 16, notice what he says, and this is so important to, to understand. God's word says that we have known and believed. Say out loud, say out loud you have to do both. Now, there are times in your life when things are good where you can know that you know that your no knows that God loves you. But it's in the bad times that you actually have to believe that he loves you. Because the circumstance that you're in is saying to you that he doesn't. You know how it is when you, uh, you got family? And like I said, next week is just going to be hilarious. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a great time. But you know, if you've got a loved one and you know they got money. Come on, you know how family, you know they got money. And you're in a situation where you could use a little help. Oh, it's quiet in this church. And so, you know, you, you somehow or another, you brave up enough courage and you're trying to ask them to help you. And for whatever reason, they don't help you. How many of y'all know you feel some kind of way towards them? <laughs> ah, come on now, y'all got to be better honest than this. You feel some kind of way towards them because they have the ability to help you. But for whatever reason, maybe something you said, maybe something you did or whatever, they are not helping you in this situation. Now, you still love them, but it's, you know, there's just something. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you feel some kind of way. How about that where it relates to God? You know God has the ability to help you, and you've braved up enough courage in prayer to ask God to help you in this situation or this circumstance, and it appears that for whatever reason, he's not helping you. And now, come on, you are feeling some kind of way about God because of the situation. And I'm really here to say that it's in those times where you've got to not only know that he loves you, you've got to believe that he loves you. Yeah. That even though he's not coming through as fast as you want him to come through, you've got to believe that even though it doesn't seem like he's helping me, I believe that he loves me. Yeah. 
And this is the thing. Love will never leave you in a bad situation. So there's, there's, there's times where you've got to know it, but then there's times that you've got to believe it. Believe the love that God has for us. That means that we could mature in our love for him. Amen. In John chapter six, three, 3 and verse 16, how many of y'all know that God loves you so much? We know that because of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. He gave up his son for you. But, you know, oftentimes I believe that people read this in a generic term and not a personal term. That God loves everybody in general. But that, you know, because of the things in my life that, you know, there's something going on. Someone once said that you've never been loved until you've been so loved. God loves you so very much. He so loves you. This is the greatest prayer that Jesus ever prayed for you, is that you would understand just how much God loves you. Of all the people that ever were, Jesus knows how much he loves you because God gave Jesus up for you. Come on, if you've ever given up something for something, you know the value because of what you gave. Amen. In John chapter 17, Jesus was praying for us. How do you know that? Well, in verse 20, the Bible says, I do not pray for these alone. He's talking about his disciples. But I pray also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's actually praying for you and me. I mean, think about it. 2,000 years ago, Jesus is praying for his disciples. But he's not praying for those alone, those 12 disciples or how many ever there were. But he's praying for those in the future who will believe on him through their word. Anybody here believe on Jesus because of that? Amen. Well, this is what he prays for you. In, in a part of the prayer, in verse 23, he prays, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now, this is phenomenal. If you don't get anything else out of this message, I pray you get this. Why? Because this verse of scripture answers the question, how much does God love me? The answer is he loves me just as much as he loves Jesus. So if we were to stand you up, me up, Bishop Jake's up, or Jesus Christ up, and ask the question out of these four, who does God love the most? The answer is he loves them all the same. He doesn't love Jesus more than a great preacher or another great preacher or another great preacher which is you, he loves us all the same. It is actually the nature of true love. It is how you should love all your children the same. You shouldn't have favorites. Oh, we're going to get into some things. I got to leave off of that. Amen. He loves us all the same. In verse 24, he continues his prayer. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. That's how much he loved Jesus. He loved Jesus from before the world was ever formed. Now, we know that Jesus was before the beginning. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the same was in the beginning with God. So he was at the very beginning before the world was ever formed. Jesus was at the very beginning. And the Bible says that before the foundations of the world was that he had the revelation that God loved him. Amen. Right. He loved him before this world was even set up. Amen. And guess what? God loves you before the foundation of the world. If you look at different scriptures, it'll tell you that before the worlds were even framed, he knew you and set you apart for your divine destiny. Amen. 
Say it out loud. God loves me just as much as he loves Jesus. When you say that out loud, love in you gets developed. It comes up to another level. Right. Before I ask, you say, how many, you know, how much does God love you? Maybe you didn't know you couldn't quantify it. But according to the scripture, you can now quantify how much he loves you. So now you can't think that he loves other people more because they're doing better than me, because they, 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 they talk better than me, because they act better than me. They, they, they're more righteous than I No, 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 no. I am developing in my perspective of God's love for me. He loves me. My faults and failures and all, he loves me just as much as he loves Jesus. Am I preaching good today? I believe that. And that is what we call perfecting love. Meditating on. If you think about this long enough, the fear of failure will run right out of the window. Why? Because God loves me. And love will never leave you in a bad situation. You know, even in Jesus' life, Jesus was in different situations and some severely bad situations. But love didn't leave him in that place. Amen. He said, I've declared unto them your name and I will declare it so that the love. Now, the word name also means authority and character. He said, I've declared unto them the nature of God. I've declared unto them the character of God. I've declared unto them all of the preachings and teachings of Jesus. He declared unto the people the, the, the authority that God has, right? And he says, I've declared unto them your nature, your authority, your name, your character, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. See, if, if, if I didn't know that God had the authority to deal with my situation, then I may not know that he loves me. Come on. If I don't know his character, that his character is love, then I may not know that he loves me. But because I declared it, now they can know it. Praise God. That the love wherewith I have loved them, that wherewith you have loved me, may be in them and I in them. Say it out loud. God loves me. And that, love and that love is in me. Now, let's look at this. Love will never, if you learn anything about love, learn this. When you hold family situations, dating, relationships, situa life, friendships, you, when, when you hold the context of love against this statement, love will never leave you in a bad situation. I know that little boy promised you that he was going to do all this and that. But if he left you, <laughs> come on, in a bad situation, that wasn't love. It was lust. Come on. It was like, but it wasn't love. Why? Because if what they did to you left you in a bad situation, that wasn't love. Because love, come on. Is this a true statement or what? It will never, love always has the other person's best interest at heart. This, when I get into this about next week with marriages and children and, and how we relate to others, it's going gonna, it's gonna to open up an understanding that the way God intended life and relationships to work was to work by love. Amen. But it first begins with you learning the love that God has for you and learning to love God better than you do right now. Amen. Amen. In Acts chapter 2, we see Jesus in a very bad situation. Matter of fact, he went to hell. How many of y'all know hell is bad? Amen. And Jesus actually went to hell. But notice what this verse says. Jesus said, in hell, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Notice the first part of that. You will not leave my soul in Hades. The prophet David spoke this, but he wasn't referring to himself. He was referring to Christ, yeah. that Christ would die on the cross, be buried in a tomb, his body, but his spirit would go to hell for three days and suffer in torment for all of the sins of the world. 
But before Jesus went to the cross, he heard David's prophecy and knew that it referred to him. And so when he was in a bad situation, he knew God's not going to leave me like this. Can you imagine? Put yourself in Jesus' situation. He's in hell being tormented for the sins of all. It could, it could have crossed his mind, as it were, that God's not coming for me. After that first day, no. I mean, the devil is telling him, I got you now. You should have bowed down to me while I was on the earth. Come on. But now I got you in hell. I'm not letting you go. Nobody has ever gotten in here and has ever gotten out. The devil is, come on, y'all know the devil is a liar. He's lying to him. God's not going to come through to you. You're not going to get out of this situation. Have you ever been there where the devil is saying you're not going to make it this time? I know God came through for you, but you done messed up. You done made a mistake. You done gone too far. You're not coming out of this. But oh, when the third day came, come on, love will never leave you in a bad situation. And God didn't leave him like that. And here, notice, if, if you meditate on this, if you realize you might be in a situation that's like hell, you might be in a relationship that feels like hell, this ought to be your meditation. God, I know you will not leave me in this situation. Come on. I know you're going to get me out. I know you're going to turn things around. Okay, I got to calm down because I got to preach the rest of this message. But boy, that's good. And he said, you will not allow your Holy One. He said, I will. He said, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God, who is faithful, will with the temptation make a way for you that you may be able to escape. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He's not going to allow you above that that you're able. I know it's tough. I know it's tight. But keep reminding yourself that he loves me. Come on, keep reminding yourself that he cares for me and love will never leave you in a bad situation. Matter of fact, Hebrew 13 and 5 says the same thing. It says, let your conduct, make, let your lifestyle be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Why? Because he himself, God himself has said, I, and it's in quotes, I will never leave you, nor forsake you that you may boldly say the Lord is my helper Amen. say it out loud God loves me, God loves me. Just, as much just as much as he loves Jesus he loves so the first part of this message was to simply give you the question how much does God love me now the New Testament was written in Greek so when the translators translated it from the original text into English, they had to look at Greek words in order to find out what was originally spoken. Yeah. In that day, Greek was like English in the United States. It's our primary language. There are other languages, but if you're going to transact business, number one language, this is supposed to be English. Well, Jesus was a Hebrew, so he spoke Hebrew Aramaic. But when it was recorded, and they have also different words, but when it was recorded, it was recorded, different words were recorded in Greek words. Now watch this. In the Greek language, <laughs> in the English language, we got one word for love, and that's love. <laughs> I love God. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my church. I also love pizza. <laughs> I'm trying to say this without laughing. I love football, right? I love golfing. But how many of y'all know there ought to be a difference between the love I have for God, right, and the love that I have for golf? And But in the, the, the disadvantage of the English language, we only get one of those words. Well, in the Greek language, there are four words for love, and it's actually four different kinds of love. Can I give you those? And these will be really important in a moment. Number one, agape. Now, agape in the Greek language is referring to the God kind of love, which is an unconditional love. It's a love with no strings attached. The God kind of love loves you with an everlasting love and an unending love. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you any more. He already loves you at maximum capacity. <laughs> Number two, storge, 
which is a mother's love. This is the second highest kind of love that exists. And I believe it. I mean, Brother Hagan taught me this. Um, he said that in the human experience, a mother's love is second only to the God kind of love. My wife's here, and we've got two children now. And I already know that I can't compete in the natural in comparison to love, right? She, she literally birthed them through her body, right? I'll never be able to experience that or, or be able to explain or comprehend that. And such, we have a mother's love. A father can give up on you. Like, you can get to a certain point where, you know, you know what, man, you, you just done, right? You just done. But a mother, I can remember, this was a true story. A, a woman, her son was a serial killer, killed several people and so forth and so on. Everybody had given up. The father turned his back on him, but the mother was there at the jail. Oh, baby, mama still love you. They don't understand. <laughs> she reaching through the bars, but they don't understand. You went through a lot. She's still loving him, right? Yeah. The whole world hates this guy. Yeah. But she's still got love for him. The third kind of love, of course, is phileo. This is where we get the word Philadelphia. Philadelphia is actually, without any translation, exact word, uh, letter for letter, Philadelphia is a brother's love, the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. And then the fourth kind is eros, and you know this one, erotic love, right, which is a sexual love. Now, this is going to be important over the next few weeks because what if... In your marriage, you have a brotherly love for your wife. <laughs> or what if you have a motherly love for your husband? So now you're talking to him like he's your child. <laughs> and, you, and you treat him like one of the kids. This literally becomes extremely important. You don't want to miss the next few weeks. Now, the biblical example of the love of God, agape, is 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. It is what we should use in all relationships, and it is this. Love suffers long and is kind. If you want to know what agape looks like, it does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Love does not behave unruly, uh, uh, behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in, in, in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Guess what? Love, God's kind of love, it never fails. Anytime you see a divorce, the love stopped because the God kind of love never quits Amen. and it's unconditional. Amen. So we're going to get into some, one, some wonderful things. So the question is, how much do you or how much does God love you? Hey, what's the answer to that question? Just as much. Come on. What's the answer? Just as much as he loves Jesus. The way to perfect that is to meditate on that. Keep that before your mind. Remind yourself and then look ex at examples that exemplify that. The second question that I want to ask you today before I let you go is how much do you love God? He loved us first. We love him as a result. But is it possible for you to love God more than you do right now? We know it's not possible for him to love you any more or less than he does. But what about you? Yeah. Is it possible that you're not? What if you've got a childlike love for God? What if your love for God is immature? Yeah. That would explain, explain why you keep having these meltdowns, believing that God's not going to come through for you. Maybe that can explain why you're ready to give up hope in this situation or in that situation because you are immature in your love for him. Maybe that'll explain why he asked you to do something and you're not doing it because you don't love him that much. You know, you ever ask a teenager to do something? Amen. Well, let's get into this. <laughs> so watch this. In the book of John, chapter 21, and verse number 15, this is a story 
of Peter. Y'all remember Peter messed up really, really bad? I mean, he started cussing. I know there's nobody here that cusses. Not old, not young. I see some big smiles, but that was in our past, right? <laughs> but Peter was in a situation where people kept pushing buttons, right? He had told the Lord, I am not going to, this is not, I will die if I had to. And Jesus told him, said, boy, by the time the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And sure enough, they came and took Jesus and he fled with the rest of them. But he followed along and he's warming himself by a fire. And this girl looking at him like, ain't you one of Jesus' disciples? He was like, girl, no. And she was like, yeah, you, matter of fact, you sound like, he was like, look, I don't know him. And then another one was like, yeah, I know, I saw you. He was like, blank, look, y'all, blank. Y'all going to leave me to blank alone. Come on. He started cussing, right? And then all of a sudden, he heard it in the background. cock a doo 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 <laughs> Oh, he felt so terrible, man. He went and he ran off. He wept. Bitterly, the Bible says. And I don't know if you've ever done something where you've sinned, it breaks your heart. You know better, but you didn't do better. And you end up in a bad, a bad place. Matter of fact, he left the ministry and went back to his old business, went back to fishing. And so one day Jesus called him and he was out on the fishing boat. Man, he was embarrassed, threw himself in the water, came to the shore. And he brought the fish, and Jesus said, bring the fish. And he fixed some, some fish, and they sat down to eat breakfast. He's in a bad place, but love will never leave you in a bad place. So at the end of breakfast, in verse 15, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Now watch this. Jesus is trying to reconnect with him because you just denied me. And anytime we sin, we're denying Christ. And he says, um, I got a question I want to ask you. Do you love me more than you love these fish? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he says, all right, well, do what I've called you to do. I said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Leave the, what, why are you going back to the fishers business? And so he's asking him in verse 15, do you love? But watch this. In the Greek, this bless me, man, this bless me. I looked this up last night. I've seen it before, but each time it amazes me. This Greek word here, do you love me more than these, is the Greek word agape. And this word where he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love, this word is phileo. That's low, y'all. Have you ever been there? I've been there. I'm there a lot. You see, when I was young in the ministry, there was a pastor I'll never forget. He, he taught me, he says, always tell the people that you love them. It's why when we catch hands at the end of service, God loves you. Pastor Stan loves you, right? I want you to know that I really do love you. And I was told to say that and to do that, right? The second thing, in my family. My dad is amazing at this. Mom and dad, are, they're both great. But my dad, for all of us, he constantly, mom too, but he, they make sure that they tell us, I love you. If my father doesn't say it multiple times before they leave or come or go, get off the phone, I mean, so it's just a reality. Mom and dad, they love us, right? But there have been times where I've told people, all right, I'll see you later. I love you. And they were like, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. It's like, oh, hey, sister, what? Man, it's okay. I'll see you next time. I love you. And it's like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> really? Oh, that's nice? <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> it is really weird. You're telling somebody that you love them. They're like, oh, okay, thank you. Now, you put it in the context, Jesus had this success. Think about how awkward this is. I'm telling you, I love you at the highest level possible. It is unconditional. You could mess up with me, and I'm still going to love you. Do you love me 
on that same level? And if their response is, well, I love you on a brotherly level. <laughs> right? And that go, that, uh, the love of a brother is really cool. I got three, I got, that's me, and then I got, <laughs> there's three boys in the family. I got two brothers, and then a bunch of spiritual brothers, of course, right? And my sister, I'm a brother, so th there's three siblings. I got three siblings. And there's a strong bond where brothers, but how many of y'all know even brothers can be in that, right? But he says, and, and he said to him again, just to clarify it, right? Look at this conversation. In verse 16, he said to him again a second time. Somebody say a second time. He said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you, and I looked it up, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? Do you love me like God loves me? Because I'm asking you all the question. And remember, we're talking about us perfecting love to get fear out of us. And the way to do that is remind yourself how much he loves you. Teach and train yourself. Develop in you how much he loves you. But also perfect love. Let love grow up in you toward God, right? Yeah. So the question is, how much do you love him? Yeah. Is God saying to you, I agape you, and you're saying back to God, I love you like I love my family? He said, yes, Lord, and just to be clear, I know that I fillet, you know that I phileo you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And then he said it a third time, verse 17. He said to him the third time. Somebody say third time. Yes. Simon Peter, now this time is different. He says, do you phileo me? Maybe the first time I was clear and you weren't. It can't be that I'm asking you very clearly. I'm, I'm really asking you something specifically. Do you love me like this? And you said again the second time, I believe this expression was a little bit different. That's all you got for me is brotherly love? Do you love me with a brotherly love, Peter? And Peter was grieved when Jesus checked him or questioned him about his love on that level. He was grieved because he had said the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things and you know that this is where I am. That's all I got for you. He said, you know that I phileo you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Where am I going with this? This is so important. Is it possible for you to love God more than you do right now? Maybe you're at a certain level where your love for God is concerned. Peter wasn't where he needed to be where his love for God was concerned. And as a result, he was dealing with grief. What is grief? It's loss. When you haven't lost anything and you grieve, you are experiencing the fear of loss. Why would Peter, nobody died, why would he be grieved? Because he believes he lost something in the relationship with Jesus, and he's afraid of that. And Jesus, whew, I'm speaking bigger than I'm thinking. Man. And Jesus is trying to help him reconnect it and redevelop it. My question to you, is it possible for you to love God more than you do right now? I know that answer for me is yes. yes thank you. Amen. Well, let me show you. The Bible talks about that you can love more or less. For example, in Luke chapter 7 and verse 40, Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, this is not Peter. This is a Pharisee. I have something to say to you. And he said, teacher, say it. So let me set this up. Now, you all remember the woman who had an alabaster box of precious ointment. She broke it and she washed Jesus' feet with her hair. You all remember that? Well, she was in the house of a Pharisee, and the Pharisee saw her doing this, and he said in his thoughts, he said, if Jesus knew that this woman was a, a woman of a very background, yeah. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. If he knew what kind of woman this was, this woman's a sinner, he wouldn't let her be touching all on his feet like that. And Peter, uh, Jesus spoke up and said, you know what, I got something to say to you. Right. We know later on in this story, she's wiping his feet with her hair, but he didn't give him any water when he came in to wash his feet. Didn't give him a towel to clean off of his feet. Right. Yeah. So there's a there's something going on here. And Jesus tells them a story about it. He says, 
I've got something to say to you. He said, teacher, say it. He said, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50. Now, I don't know what a denarii is, but let's just put it in context. Let's say somebody owes you $500 and you, or somebody else owes you $50. Come on, which one is like, that's a big deal. Or how about this? Let's say you owe $500,000, but there is something, somebody that just owes $50,000. There's a huge, there's very disproportionate. He says there was a guy that had somebody like that. And sure enough, in verse 42, and sure enough, when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? You all know the answer. The guy that owes 500000 or 50000 compared to this small, this very small. Somebody owe you $500 and this, you, you forgive them both. Which one's going to love you the most? The one that you forgave the most. And that explains... This woman, he said, I suppose the one whom forgave more. And he said, you, you, you've rightly judged. It is possible for you to love God more than you do, but it's based on your perspective. If you feel like he's forgiven you more, then you'll love him more. But if you feel like he's forgiven you less, I'm not as bad as other people. I haven't robbed. I haven't murdered. I haven't stole. Come on, I feel like I'm better than them. Oof, right? And now it affects how I express love to him. So let me ask you, how can we love him more? I'm going to give you three things and I'm going to let you go. Number one, in John chapter 14, and in the process of loving God more than you do right now, you'll be taking your love from a childlike teenager love to a fully grown, fully mature adult love. How do you do that? He said, if you love me, then do what I tell you to do, right? So in, in verse 23, he said the same thing. Jesus answered and said, if anyone loves me, he will do what? Keep my word. He will obey me and my father will love him and we will come and make our home with him. What am I saying to you? Number one, love God more by being more obedient. Amen. Love him by obeying him. When he tells you to do something, do it. Amen. And when you do that, then you are expressing love. You are taking love to a higher level. And when you do that, Fear will run right out, right? When you know that you're loving God at maximum capacity, then, then fear will run right out. Number two, in Mark chapter 7 and verse 6, he answered and said to them, well, did Isaiah the pro uh, prophesy of you hypocrites as is written? You know what a hypocrite is, two-faced. They say one thing, do another. They're a person with a mask on. You don't get the real thing. He says, well, did pro Isaiah prophesy about you? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is what? Far from me. In other words, they, they were all up in church. I love you, Lord, and I live my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my king. They're in, there, they're in church. They're worshiping him with his lips, but their heart, come on, somebody, is far from him. They're not loving him the way that they should. Why? How is, how is it that their words were right, but their heart was so far away? We'll look at another verse in Luke 12, 34. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Their heart was far from him because they gave no treasure to him. What am I saying? If you want to love God more than you do right now, number two, Love him with your money. I got one yes and an amen. I'm looking for some amen. Can I get an amen on Facebook? Amen. Amen. Think about it. You're saying you love him, but when you look at your checkbook, you spend more on you, do, on you and your kids, come on, than you do on God. And what that does is it, it exposes your heart. It exposes your heart. I mean, tithing ought to be a no-brainer for a person who loves God. There should be no struggle about giving God any percentage of your income. Any percentage. There should be no, no contemplation. When, listen, when you love, you give. I feel like I'm pulling teeth. I better go to the next one. I better go to the next one. 
What's number three? Matthew 10 and 37. He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. How much do you love your family? Ooh, how about this one? And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So when you ask the question, how can you love him any more? Let me ask you, do you love your children more than you love God? And how can you tell? If the treasure in the heart thing works, do you give more to your children than you give to God? Oh, ouch. Ooh, ah. Ooh man, they mad at me. <laughs> Look at that. He who loves son or daughter more than they love me is not worthy of me. So what do you do? Number three, love him more than, you know, people put family first. You better hurry up and play something soft. This one, this one's turning out bad, brother. You, I think you moved a little too slow. <laughs> it's, it's, the end of that, Pastor, you was going good right up to the end of that message. I don't know. This one's going to bottom out. <laughs> How do you love him more than you do right now? Love him by obeying him. Love him with your money. And then make sure you intentionally love him more than you love your family. He's not telling you not to love them. But he's telling you that you ought to love him more because he's the one who can keep them. He's the one that can really protect them. The Bible says that when your father or your mother forsake you, the Lord will take you up. I already know both my boys are going to leave me. I just know it. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, the Bible says they shall leave father and mother and cleave to the wife. That's the word. They're going to leave me. That's why I love their mom more than them. I love them more than me. Amen. But I love her more than them, which means I love her more than me. But I tell you the truth, I love God more than them all. I do. In my life, it is God first. You know, what's, what's the proof of that? What's the proof of it? Not just with my words, not just with my words. Let's look at my bank account. Let's look at how much I give. Oh, pastor, you give? Yeah, I tithe. I give back to the church. Amen. In other ministries, I, I make sure that I get. Why? Because I'm in love yeah. with God. Amen. Amen. And that's a mature, fully developed. Now, next week, this whole series shifts because we are supposed to love our spouse with the God kind of love Amen. and our kids and as well as others. But let me give you your homework for this week. Number one, I want you to work on this week. Believing that God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus, okay? So throughout this week, if you think about church, if you think about the word, just remind yourself, God loves me just as much. Come on, say it, just as much. Just as much as he loved Jesus. And then number two, the second thing I want you to work on this week, I want you to work on loving God more than you do right now. Amen? Maybe you need to rethink tithes and offerings. Amen? Maybe you need to Look at how much you love other things in comparison to loving God. And I believe, as a result, fear will run right out your life. Go ahead and stand up on your feet. Thank you, uh, Facebook, for being a part of this ministry today. And we hope to see you next time. God bless you. Come on, put your hands together for the Facebook family. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to pray for you. Maybe you're in a bad situation and you feel...